council member, I wanted to plug a couple um, upcoming events that we have. Um, we have uh, for our March 9th meetup, we're excited to have Roger Millar, the, uh, the director of Washington State Department of Transportation, um, who owns several key pieces of infrastructure that run through our fine city. Um, so if you ever have questions about the future of I-5 or Highway 99 or why all the money that could be spent on light rail expansion goes to suburban freeway projects. Um, this is your chance to ask him. And then April 13th, we will have Andrew Grant Houston, Houston mayoral candidate, architect, urbanist. Um, we're, I'm very excited to hear what he has to say and what his platform is. Um, and then May 11th, we'll have Sam Asefa, the head of the Office of Planning and Community Development, which is very timely as the comprehensive plan update will be starting this year. Um, and then I think Doug has already handled his own intro and given a little talk about us. Um, so now I'm gonna hand it over to Teresa but before I do that, she's gonna speak for a few minutes and then we've collected some questions from you. And if you have more questions, throw them in the chat um, as we go. And then whenever she's done, we will try to um, see how many questions we can get through without taking too much of uh, Councilman Mosqueda's time, which I'm sure is very scarce. And now I will hand it over to Councilman Mosqueda um, to tell us about herself and her work. Well, thank you very much um, for having me in this forum. I think the last time I came to an urbanist meetup, we actually all had drinks in our hand and we were around a pool table and we were having a good time just learning from each other and talking about uh, the situations in Seattle. And I very much hope that we can do that again someday because it's really good to see a lot of faces that I recognize. And I also uh, really can't wait to get back out there and really engage because um, that's where the good stuff happens when we get to just sort of um, chat and uh, have a conversation. So thanks for letting me pop into the Zoom as you will. So um, I am here in my capacity as a candidate. I hope that's okay. I'm happy to take questions as well um, as they relate to both um, how we can make sure that we are bringing the voice of urbanist advocates um, into not only this election and raising issues as I run for re-election, but also getting stuff done as we um, are here uh, in in the throes of trying to build a more equitable, accessible, affordable Seattle for everyone. So thanks again for having me um, as part of the Urbanist crew. I wanna say, um, you know, it's been a long, a long year. The last year feels like it's four years all rolled up into one, um, but we've been able to really accomplish quite a bit in the last year and um, the last four years with your support. I'm really honored to have been able to work with all of you over the last few years and to be here again, asking for your support potentially for this run for re-election for position eight. Hi babies, I love um, baby kiddos pet pop in. So i um, so excited about that. Um, and uh, I, I really just wanna say thank you for all of your advocacy during this last year's budget. Folks might know that this was my first year being able to be the budget chair. And um, I'm really proud that of many of the things that we were able to accomplish, I feel like the budget in front of us is the beginning of what an urbanist budget should look like. We didn't have all the resources that we need and we sure didn't get to every single item, but when I look at the um, list of items that the urbanists and others sent us in terms of priorities for the budget, I believe we were able to uh, address all of those in this year's budget. And that means fund, funding more sidewalk connections, funding more connect through community so that there was uh, protected pathways, funding true protected bike lanes and actually making sure that people had a safe place to ride and walk amongst our streets. Making sure that there's paths and connectors is not only good for our environment because we want more people out there, out of their cars and enjoying Seattle's neighborhoods, but it's also really important, especially as we think about a recovery out of uh, COVID and what a more connected, equitable community means. I want there to still be the number of people that I see in my neighborhood out there walking. I, I don't know about all of you and, and the pockets that we are all in, um, in, in quarantine and, and in COVID times, but I 
have the opportunity to walk to my daycare. I can walk to my grocery store. I can walk to the local pub and the restaurants around the corner. I'm here in North Delridge and you'd think that, oh, maybe there's not that many access to high access opportunities there. We have a lot of parks around here. We have a lot of open space. And I see so many families and people of all ages, abilities, races, genders, um, ethnicities out there walking more than I've ever seen before. And in part, I think it's because we're um, home during COVID and I want that sense of community to remain, but far too many of the communities that have been calling for action for so long and much of what the urbanist agenda I think has been lifting up is that we haven't had that equitable infrastructure across Seattle. So um, part of I think how we build a more equitable recovery and a more connected community as we as we get out of COVID is to do things like make sure that there's connectors, sidewalks, bike lanes. Um, and in addition to that, we made sure that there was no cuts to transit, that we kept our libraries open, that we invested in child cares, and that we made historic investments in housing in the out years. We weren't actually able to reflect all of the money coming into the door because of Jumpstart, but that money is starting to be collected this year. And thanks to urbanists and all of the folks, the huge coalition that supported the progressive payroll tax, 68% uh, of the 214 plus million dollars that we're getting in the door is going to go to affordable housing and, and density and additional support services so that people can actually afford to live in the city they work. Um, you all, I think you know, the whole story of Jumpstart is, is a little bit of like the untold story of 2020 and um, without your support to help bring together such a broad coalition that focused on Green New Deal investments, housing and equitable um, recovery and resilience we would have seen major cuts to the budget, austerity budgeting, like some of the other um, cities had proposed and, and some of the austerity budgeting that the mayor had initially proposed. So we were able to fight back against that austerity concept. And um, obviously there's a lot more to do, but I wanna say thank you for all of your support uh, for Jumpstart and the work that we were able to accomplish. And I think that we've only begun to sort of see the tip of the iceberg in terms of how that funds can, those funds can help uh, build the, the dense, connected, affordable, um, and resilient economies that we need. Um, and then I'll just say this, and because I want to hear all of your questions that you might have as well. Um, there are, there, there's un, untold numbers of losses in terms of lives and livelihoods in the last year. And, you know, as we come up on Memorial Day at the first of March, we're going to have a proclamation that recognizes how many folks within our communities we've lost to this deadly virus. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in many ways, the, the numbers are much bigger than what we've seen. I know a lot of you have probably dealt with this as my family and friends have, but we've lost folks as well, just to the sheer stress of dealing with COVID. Um, people who had, you know, never been, um, you know, using substances and tried to find some way to cope with the stress of losing their jobs and the stress of potentially losing their homes. Uh, we've seen a lot of people um, just with the sheer impact and stress on their physical health um, have other um, situations where they've lost their lives uh, due to heart attack and, and other stressors. So uh, I know that there's a lot that we need to do to um, mourn the loss and in, in doing so also think about the Seattle that we want to become as we think about the, the sacrifices so many have made over the last year. This, there is an initial sort of, there's a interesting element though to the policies that have quickly been changed in the last eight to 10 months. And if there is a kernel of potential opportunity and hope in some of the ways in which we've seen policies change relatively quickly, I think we should jump on it. Because we saw quickly overnight that street vacations were possible across the city, that shutting down streets to cars and actually making sure that we put up signs to make them welcoming to families and folks who are just, you know, using strollers and uh, rolling, roller skates. I saw that once out here in, a, um, in an area in West Seattle where roller derby folks were coming out and it was amazing. And I was out there with my kiddo and her stroller. And we also saw elders walking in the street with their walkers. I mean, we shut down streets within a very short period of time and it was possible. Let's make those permanent. Let's make the street vacations permanent. Let's make those parking lots that we've turned into little eateries permanent. Let's take back our streets that had been so car dominated and let's actually use the policies that we saw change overnight to bring people together to create a healthier space for people to come out of their homes and hopefully get some fresh air and, and see people. Let's put those into policy uh, and into statute for the long haul. Because I think the type of changes that we began to see um, give us an indication that 
the resistance that we had been he hearing of for so long can be undone with the stroke of a pen. And if it takes the council to make it so it's not temporary and it's truly long-term, I'm ready to work with all of you on that. So I'm excited about making the healthy, safe streets, healthy, safe, and permanent streets that are closed, um, making more of these um, parking spaces and allow them to continue to be the small eateries and tables and gathering spaces and places to put your, put your um, bike or your stroller, like, let's do it. Let's keep these spaces open. And then let's go beyond that, right? Because I still want that Barcelona super block. I still want to make sure that we're shutting down um, larger swaths so that there's truly a connected area. And I still am very interested in working with all of you on many of the issues that have also been told or that we've all been telling. We've all been told were impossible, like the lid um, and trying to make more connected communities where there's currently streets dividing our communities. And then I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this one last item as we talk about the comp plan. Somebody just mentioned that. Patrick, I think you mentioned that. Um, you know, we talk about the minor changes and the major changes and the major pain right now is that unless we get some items on the docket for including into the major policy changes, we're looking at another eight year wait, right? And we don't have time to wait another eight years to undo what are segregationist zoning and housing policies that are still included in the fabric of what makes up Seattle's zoning code. And um, I am really interested this year in working with all of you to truly create an inclusive Seattle as we think about zoning definitions and moving to true residential zoning. Let's do this. Right now, I just heard from um, a family who is up in the Green Greenwood area and they have innovated, right? They are on a um, street vacation, healthy street block where there's families and folks walking around all the time. They usually sell hard cider out of, um, you know, they're a vendor, but they decided to open the front of their garage and turn what was a carport into a place for people to come and, and, um, and use it as a small business location because people were walking by. This is the example of what we want people to do, get out of their cars, to interact with their neighbors, to support small businesses. And they've been told they can no longer keep that small cider establishment open. It's called Yonder if you want to check it out. Um, and why? Because it's currently in a single family zone and it's not allowed to be there. Let's change these policies. It's not actually helping to create the innovative economic drivers across our city so that small businesses can crop up, so that we can have multifamily housing, so that we can have uh, you know, mixed income and mixed use housing. And it's standing in the way of the inclusive Seattle that we all want to be. So I'll stop there. I think we have so much uh, that we've been able to potentially accomplish together. And it's hard, it's hard looking back over the last three and a half years to um, remember all of the things that we have changed. We've done a lot together and I look forward to, to working with you to lift those up. But if we've just gotten a sliver of indication of how quickly some of these um, transportation, zoning, and um, infrastructure changes can be made, let's keep pushing forward because this is actually how we create, you know, a city that that cares about the health and well-being of everyone. Uh, and with that, thanks again for having me, and happy to take any questions. I hope I can answer them, and if I can't, I'll make sure to get back to you. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, you covered so much there already. Um, so, all right, I'll start with uh, um, homelessness. The city has one of the highest number of people living unsheltered in the country. And we're now, we're now several years into a homelessness state of emergency. Yet it doesn't seem like to the casual observer that it's getting better. Can you talk about what the council has been doing and what you think the path to sheltering all our city's residents is? Yes, I think the path to sheltering those without a home is to provide them a home. Uh, and the the struggle that we see on the street with more folks living in parks and on the side, um, the side of our streets and RVs, it is heartbreaking. We've seen more and more, and I know my neighborhood has seen more and more folks there. And I hear from a lot of families who want to be able to access those parks. I want I hear from a lot of individuals who um, are worried about the people who are living outside. In addition to people who say that they don't want folks there and they're and they're upset about the trash. All of those are valid. And the solution is to house folks and to help them get into the services that they need so that they can stay stably housed. There has been, I have scars to prove some of the battle wounds that we've had on council over the last three years. Um, but the biggest, uh, the biggest um, challenge that I have right now is that 
we do not have the housing, the permanent supportive housing and the affordable housing to help move folks out of shelter. And when people talk about there um, being too many folks living outside, that's true. And our shelters were at capacity before COVID. On one night in, a, in fall, just before COVID hit, I asked in a presentation, how many enhanced shelter beds do you have open per night? This is when the navigation team was still out there sweeping. And um, if you're telling me that you're moving folks off the street from, you know, or, or out of a park, are they getting into shelter actually? And the answer was that there is one, one enhanced shelter bed open on average per night before COVID. There is no possible way that we can house, you know, the nearly 12,000 people who needed um, access to shelter who were living um, outside in our, in our region when that's the type of access that we have to shelters. And it's because we haven't opened up enough housing to help move folks through that shelter infrastructure and into housing. Um, and when I say enhanced, that's because they don't get kicked out in the morning, they don't have mats on the floor, they're not having to line up at night. I mean, if you want, we want to create stability, people need a locker, they need a shower, they need a place that, you know, they feel safe. Ideally, they need a room and they need a door and they need a roof and they need counseling. So uh, number one, we did not have enough access to shelter before COVID. The reason that I think we can continue to see more people living outside. First of all, people, a lot of people have lost their jobs and many, many folks are just one paycheck away from being outside themselves. Um, and when they did lose their jobs and they um, uh, may have lost their housing or didn't know that there was eviction protection ordinances because while they're on the books, they don't always get translated um, to folks who are facing eviction. And we know it's more likely to be women, people of color, low wage workers, members of the LGBTQ community, um, folks with disabilities who are more likely to experience housing insecurity to begin with and are more likely to um, still face eviction even in this time. So we're seeing more folks outside and then we have not opened the shelters that we needed to in a post-COVID world. Immediately in March last year, I began pounding on the doors of the mayor's office to say we needed to open hotels. We needed to get folks into vacant hotel rooms. And there's a number of hotels at the time who were working with DESC and LEAD and had and continue to have rooms available and the capacity to staff people, um, to staff individuals so that they have the support they need. Um, it is now February of 2021 and we still are in a battle to try to get the dollars that we put in the budget out the door so people can get appropriate ho housing in hotels, tiny homes and open up more non-congregate shelters. Um, but to the person who asked the question, those are sort of just the recent examples of why I think we continue to see increased numbers of people living outside. And I think the bigger picture, the macro answer is we have got to triple, quadruple, you know, double, more than double down our investments in housing and permanent supportive housing and to build, build in the air, build in the airspace above many of our underutilized um, spaces throughout Seattle so that we can create the true density, affordable housing, permanent supportive housing that folks need to stay stably housed. And not everybody who is homeless um, is uh, dealing with any substance abuse at all. But I do want to underscore the importance of having case managers and also um, access to counselors, because even if you're very clean and sober, living indoors for the first time after living outside for so long, it is, uh, you need support to be there. And for all of those, including many of us who are housed, who are dealing with the stress and, and turn to substance abuse we or substances, we need to be able to have access to um, health counselors across the board. Uh, so this is not an issue that just affects our um, unsheltered population. And then lastly, uh, it's about building as many um, you know, shelters and uh, tiny homes and access to hotels and you name it to help folks get off the street because we overall as an entire community, our population health, improves when folks are not living outside. And that's true for the folks who are living outside currently and don't have access to services. It's also true for the health of everybody here. It's not good for our psyche. It's not good for our uh, community identity to have so many people living outside in one of the most wealthy cities in the most wealthy country in the entire world. So um, look forward to keep fighting for more shelter, but overall more housing as well. Thank you. Um, on a related question from an attendee. It's, it's been reassuring to see eviction matoria for multiple levels of government during the economic and public health crisis. What local policies do you envision or support to prevent widespread evictions and you know, home, no doubt homelessness once the moratoria are lifted? 
Well, we have put in more of a support for there to be access to um, uh, legal assistance, legal representation to prevent displacement, I'm sorry, to prevent uh, eviction. Um, and that's a really important thing for us to make sure that folks have legal representation. But even that alone is not enough. Um, so I'd like to see us do additional eviction um, prevention strategies to extend the moratorium and also rental assistance to make sure that folks are not in that position. It is going to be a quite a while, even if we were to able, if we, even if we were able to achieve herd immunity and the prospect of that right now with how slow the rollout is going, thanks to the Trump administration, um, we have got to be thinking about rental assistance for uh, the long haul, at least, you know, over the next year plus. That as well is something that um, I think is not only good for those who are renting, more than half of folks in Seattle rent, obviously you all know that, um, but it's also good for some of those small landlords that we've been hearing from, you know, and, and I'm not talking about like, like large, large landlords. I'm talking about some small landlords, especially elderly folks, um, uh, folks from communities of color who may have the ability to have income from that, that rental unit. This is an economic stimulant when we can make sure that renters have the ability to pay. You know, if we were in most uh, other countries that are similar to us, capitalists in nature, uh, what they have done is true wage replacement, 60, 70, 80, 90% of your wages actually replaced. That in and of itself is rental assistance. It's support for landlords. It's economic stimulants to local businesses. So the very least we could be doing is making sure that folks have rental assistance, protection from eviction, and also um, making sure that there's additional cash assistance getting out the door as, an, as a true economic stimulant. Um, and then I also look forward to hearing from all of you. Many of you I know have been engaged in the tenants' rights protection uh, world for a very long time and very much open to hearing what you all are hearing from um, uh, communities about how we can do uh, how we can prevent there from being a cliff because the second that eviction moratorium is lifted folks are going to fall off that cliff and we got to prevent that thanks thank you um we already brought up the comprehensive plan a little bit if you're re-elected you're going to be in office through much of that update like what 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 do you want to see what are you going to advocate to see in that that latest update? Well, the biggest thing that I want to see, I already mentioned, um, is a change in the, the zoning code. I mean, the zoning, the zoning name and to really have residential zoning. I mean, we got Olympia leading the way in the Puget Sound here. I just heard Tacoma did something you all probably know better than I do. And, and who else just did something? Berkeley, right? Some of these places where we've heard year over year, like that the, you know, the, the um, resistance to creating more inclusive, dense um, urban areas in the Bay Area, they're doing it. Why, we cannot wait another eight years. So that's the biggest issue that I have on my radar. A few other small ones that, I, that I maybe I'll tell you about as well. Um, very interested to do more to make sure that we can get more um, units on some of these lots. Uh, I think that we, um, we have a situation where some of the townhouses are rounding down to three units on a lot. Um, would very much like to round up to four. All of you uh, on this call might know better how to explain that. But you know, uh, with MHA, I don't want folks to be thinking, okay, I can get that, that extra space if I can build a fifth floor. No, I like there to be another unit on that same lot. So that's something that I've heard from AIA as a big priority. I'll be working on that. We did some minor things like making sure that um, some of the ADUs and DADUs can have um, rooftops that don't count towards the floor area ratio for the actual unit so that we can actually create more outdoor spaces for people to enjoy our city without having to, um, you know, have yards, for example. So would love to continue to go down that similar vein of creating more opportunities for people to live in the city on these plots of land that become available and to build up and also create more space on the rooftops. Um, and there was one more thing all my staff will probably be like, why didn't you bring this up? Um, but I uh, would love to hear from all of you what your priorities are for the comp plan as well. You know, given that this doesn't come up very often, would like to, to have a full list in front of us as we move forward. And maybe Patrick, if, if there's time, um, I could take down some notes about what folks would like to see as well in, in the comp plan. Yeah, if people want to throw their um, thoughts into the chat, maybe her, you can see them, we can record some of those. Um, you, you advocated and got funding for race and social justice analysis of the city's urban village 
plan, correct? Could you talk about where that's gone and how that is um, about how the, yeah. Yeah, huge shout out to Michael Maddox. Um, he really led the charge in our office to make sure that um, people were able to, to provide sort of a spotlight on to what is not working in our current zoning policies and using the racial equity toolkit to look, to do that analysis of what our uh, current strategies are exposes what we know to be true communities of color largely low-income folks um, folks who are from immigrant and refugee populations communities of color getting left out of opportunities to live in our city and also getting pushed out of the city because we're not allowing for there to be zoning. Uh, folks know that I lived in an apartment that uh, was in Queen Anne until very recently and that apartment, a four-story apartment, brick facade, um, you know, cute old apartment from 1911, I think, um, considered illegal right now. And when the, the house next door to us got bulldozed, what got put up in its place, not another apartment like the one that I lived in or the one that was next door that was allowed to be zoned. No, because we had been down zoned over not the, you know, not a hundred years ago, not 50 years ago, but within the last few decades. And um, so what I think we need to be doing is fighting for that more inclusive Seattle, but looking at it from the racial equity perspective, because it's not just about, you know, who got, who, who didn't get the opportunity to live in, in that apartment, it's the fact that, you know, especially in Queen Anne, we're excluding folks, low wage workers, people of color, members of the LGBTQ community, folks who are more likely to be renters, we're excluding them from high opportunity areas like the one I lived in because there was like four, four parks in the neighborhood, a bus stop right outside, more, more grocery stores than I can count on one hand, you know, huge opportunity areas. Um, so appreciate that we have the racial equity toolkit that got put together, and I believe it's getting released in the next two months. Um, and I will follow up with you on that because I was going to say April, but it might be June and it's coming. Let's say that in the next few months. And this, I think, will give us an opportunity uh, to um, to really push uh, using that in the comp plan too. Some of you are all probably checking that. So if you have the answer to that, please do let me know. Sorry, I don't have that date on hand. Thanks. I think we're all really excited to see that. Um, I want oh, can to I say this... one more thing about that? Oh yeah, please, please. Sorry, and then I know uh, we're probably um, taking all of your time, but um, we had the chance to meet with some people who came out from Minneapolis uh, two years ago, pre-COVID. I think I was pretty pregnant at the time, um, and uh, had the chance to hear from them about you know what what did they do? How did they move? the ball. And they said that they didn't have to do something like a racial equity toolkit. In fact, everybody just acknowledged that their existing policies and all of the data they look at already told them what this racial equity toolkit is going to say. I mean, we have the color of law who calls out Seattle for the inequities that still exist in our zoning policies. So yes, I'm very excited that we have this, our, this racial equity toolkit and thank you for your support on that. And here we are two years after we got it in, into the budget, right? And we're still waiting for the data. So there is no excuse. As soon as we get that information, I think it's our chance to hit the go pedal very fast. I use a very car centric term there. Um, I think it's our chance to hit the go on the scooter <laughs> thumb um, very fast and um, you know just no more delays because this data is going to come back saying what we already knew. Excellent. I'm going to stay on this for just a little bit longer because we've gotten so many questions about it. Um, so when, when we talk about opening up um, single family zoning for more options, could you talk a little more about what that means to you? Because I know some people are saying four floors in a corner store um, everywhere in the city of Seattle and other people have talked about like Maybe it's you know just a duplex or a triplex or some sort of other system in between. And then also on a related note, um, how do we allow our city and our neighborhoods to continue growing while also uh, making sure that you know some of our um, that our BIPOC community and our older community, you know, a lot of older people and others can like continue to live in this city and stay in place and make sure that they aren't displaced by um, new development. Okay, great. Um, so in terms of what that looks like, I mean, I think that the the missing middle reports that we've continued to see show a spectrum, right? It should be anywhere along that spectrum between 
a duplex, a triplex, a fourplex. It could also potentially be like my apartment, you know, four floors, but there was eight units inside. Um, it could be, you know, some of the buildings that I'm seeing now finally coming up here on in West Seattle, closer to, um, you know, a very frequently used corridor around California, where there's six floors, beautiful facade on the outside, setbacks, trees. I mean, these are the type of options that should fill in that missing middle range. And so, it, you know, happy to talk more if we need to um, continue to flush that idea out. But when I talk about what it looks like, it's really that range of options because right now we don't have that, op we, don't, we, don't, we don't have those options. Um, and I think as we create more more opportunities throughout the city, then potentially we do have that childcare center on the first floor and that small business that somebody's able to open on the first floor and the community center and things like that. So getting slightly larger means more inclusive Seattle and more walkable neighborhoods. And so, um, you know, part of the, the, the answer to your second question is making sure we include the policies that I led on in the um, administration and finance plan last year, ANF plan, which was to make sure that we included community preference and really reach back out to communities in our neighborhoods that are getting pushed out and ask them, you know, do you want to come back We're creating space? We have one, two, three, four bedrooms available. Um, is this somewhere that you'd like to live? Now, some folks, for example, in Yesler Terrace have said, you know, I've created a new community in Kent, for example, my family's here, I'm going to stay here. But 100% of the people have been asked if they want to come back. And 100% of those in the Yesler Terrace area who wanted to come back have been able to get a, a new unit back in that Yesler Terrace um, uh, development. So development, as I said four years ago, but this is a great example, Does development does not have to equal displacement if we do it right. And being afraid of, um, you know, building up and building more and building a more inclusive, um, dense and connected Seattle, um, I get that because a lot of times, especially in communities of color, development or infrastructure changes have meant displacement. You know, freeways going through communities that had previously been there. We saw it here, we saw it in Detroit, we see it across this country. So understanding the root of those concerns and the real lived experience of people getting pushed out and having housing and often zoning language be kind of exclusive, right? Knowing the acronyms for FAR and AM, I don't know, I was gonna go down the rabbit hole of um, alphabet soup, but I'll refrain because you all know, you all know that th that sort of language, it is important to know so that we can push policy change, but it shouldn't have to be that way. And breaking that, that language barrier to make it more inclusive to talk about housing and zoning and transit and infrastructure is something that I'm really excited about because when we pull folks in and we say, this is different, this time you're at the table, this time we can build housing that is in sort of uh, the vision of community and we all lift up the example of El Centro de la Raza and the Roberto Maestra Plaza and the way in which density has been created there around the transit hub um, with the community center, with small businesses and a childcare. Like this is everything we want, right? It took them eight years to get the funding that they need. So let's make sure that we're learning from these past experiences of people being harmed by some of these, the, the policies and language in the past, be inclusive, but also make it not so dang hard to do it right the first time. And, there's a lot I know that we could all work on there in um, the, the um, approval of certain buildings, but maybe that's for another day. Um, I do want to uh, note that I should probably run to get the kiddo to sleep here soon. Um, so uh, Patrick, I'm not sure if you want to ask a few more questions or if I can follow up with you also. Yeah, let me, uh, how about I can sneak in like two more quick questions. Is that okay? Um, I'll try to be less long-winded. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And we understand you got to balance your duties. Um, we had a historic year of protests in 2020 to make sure all Black Lives Matter. Um, the council has taken some action. And if you ask my uh, dad and in-laws, we're an anarchist jurisdiction that has eliminated the police. But I think a lot of activists on the street think the council has failed to live up to its commitment to defund the police. Um, where do you think we are in terms of meeting the demands of Black Lives Matter protesters and where do you see the future of criminal justice in Seattle? Yeah, um, so I think like many of the policies we've all worked on, um, it is important to sort of celebrate what you are able to get past and to always 
not sit back and pat yourself on the back. Um, and there is nothing more pressing than people dying, black and brown folks dying on camera and having that done in the name of government or in the name of state or city. And that's what is been that's what has been happening. And that was what happened um, with George Floyd, but it has been happening repeatedly uh, over the last few years. And the call to action is something that we need to we needed to act upon and we need to continue to do more. I did have the chance to listen in on the King County Equity Now and Decriminalize Seattle um, summary of the um, budget presentation after we passed our final budget this, this um, winter. And what I heard on that call was we have, we have made a lot of progress and there's so much more to do. Seattle is second only to Austin. Austin City Council passed a reduction in their overall police department um, in terms of reduction and transfers, um, slightly larger than the city of Seattle. Then it's Seattle, then I believe it's Los Angeles, Los Angeles, and then I think it's New York. Um, but the point is to, to transfer out of the department things that should not be militarized, should not be done in the name of policing, like mental health services, like traffic infractions, like um, calls for folks who uh, need access to case management. We should have different people responding to that than folks with a gun and a badge. And that, that process we've begun. We've moved a lot of folks out of um, the department and into civilian roles, especially if you think about people who are dying on camera for traffic infractions. Um, taking that out of uh, uh, SPD is an important thing to do. If you think about Charlena Lyles and the fact that she had um, basically um, been undergoing what, what folks believe is um, a crisis related to mental health, armed officers should not be showing up. We still have 911 calls that are mental health related being answered by armed officers, while all other health related calls now go to the fire department. There's a lot that we need to do. And I also think that we're on the right path towards um, right sizing our investments in community. $60 million is what we put aside between the two task force that are looking at participatory budget investments. And I'm hopeful that those um, efforts will merge and that we will be able to stand up more community response. Uh, there still has to be someone who is you know, answering a call, uh, if it's a mental health call or any type of call to a 911-like element, but it doesn't have to be an armed officer if that's not what's needed. Um, and so in many ways, I think we have begun the path to respond and there's a lot more that we can do. And I think, um, you know, uh, we have done what a lot of community was just talking about today when they were talking about COVID response and inequities there. Um, we have shifted power. We're not just talking about bringing people to the table. We are shifting power because we are shifting money in directly into communities who are being most harmed by um, murders at the hands of um, uh, the government and making sure that those who are most directly impacted have the chance to really decide where those funds go. Uh, so it's going to be a little bit longer of a process than I know folks want and I'm not a believer in like incrementalism, but I think that uh, we have made some important changes and will continue to make some. Great, thank you. And then the, the last question is, um, okay. <laughs> the, the urbanist is not endorsing yet, but um, this is your time. So if people were inspired by what they heard, what can they do to support your campaign? Um, you're, you're doing these vouchers, right? Heck yes. Okay, so uh, we made history four years ago. You all helped to make me the first candidate to ever win using democracy vouchers. And we've gotten calls from Oakland and Austin and New York and the folks have been like, come tell us how it's been done. But you all passed this, right? This is a citizens initiative and we just had the chance to prove that it works. Um, and uh, we ran a campaign, Catherine Bobman's on the line here um, with making sure that we were committed to um, small dollar ca campaign contributions, democracy voucher dollars, we maxed out on the vouchers last year, last year, uh, last campaign four years ago, and you all helped make history again. We're the first campaign to qualify for democracy vouchers. Thank you very much for many of you on the line. I see you um, who donated and helped sign the form. Uh, so this basically means it's no money out of your pocket. Democracy vouchers get mailed out tomorrow. I don't know if Catherine, if I'm stealing your thunder, thunder. I see you also posting some things in the links. Thank you so much. Um, democracy vouchers actually get mailed out tomorrow. And that means that 
in your mail, there will be soon a hundred bucks that you can use towards the candidate of your choice for vouchers, each $25 worth. Um, and really, I'm telling you, it made a huge difference last year. I used to run the Path to Power program. Folks probably know, like encouraging people to run for office, folks like who look like all of you on this call, younger folks, working families, women, people of color, members of the LGBT communities, like labor members. And the first thing they would say is like, I don't know somebody who has $10,000 they can give me. I don't know someone with 5,000, neither do I. And now candidates don't need to do that. We don't have to be sitting away in a room dialing for dollars because folks who are in community who have a voice through these vouchers can make it possible for us to do um, door to door conversations. I will be doing that with mask on and sa safely social distancing again, but those democracy voucher dollars do just that. They help make a truly more uh, responsive and representative democracy. When I was at the doors, people would be like, I was wondering what to do with these things. And this is really you. And I have to tell you, nobody has ever come to my door before. Nobody has bothered to ever talk to me about my vote before. Thank you for coming because this is the first time I actually am feeling heard, right? And that's what vouchers have the power to do. Um, so if you all are interested, um, I, Catherine, please feel free to chime in, um, but I would love to have your support, obviously. Uh, I would love to have your democracy vouchers as well, at least um, if you can you know, spare two of them. I know some people might wanna hold on to uh, two or so, but would love to have your support. And again, unlike some other jurisdictions, it's not a matching program. Uh, so no money right out of your pocket. Catherine, anything else? Yep, I, I popped a link in if you want to pledge some vouchers to Teresa. That way we can follow up with you if you have any questions. But um, you covered it. Did you all get a chance to use those vouchers then last time and the time before? It's, I mean, it's awesome. fun. Huh? Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's um, so great. Yeah, it's an amazing program. It's allowed people like you to and others to get elected without uh, hustling among the rich and powerful for money. It's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. And we're gonna have a party uh, to celebrate the democracy voucher um, qualification uh, uh, Thursday the 18th at um, 4.30, I hope. That's not too early for some folks, but you know, I, I will tell you that I know a lot of folks who were on these Zooms all day. They also um, you know, are struggling to sort of do their evening chores and stuff like that, or chores, all of our other responsibilities. Um, and so if you all can pop in, um, we're gonna just have a little party and bring your kids, bring your pets, bring your you know happy hour drink if you want to, um, but bring those democracy vouchers because we're gonna show folks how to use them and really just try to make it celebratory since it's so far to see, I'm so hard to see so, so many of you from afar, but uh, it'll be fun. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I don't want to take any more of it. You got to, like you got a kiddo to put to bed. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, and it's really great to council. see a lot of you. And um, I do hope you're healthy and I really appreciate everything you've all been doing um, even before COVID, but especially now and trying to make sure our communities are healthy and connected. Uh, so thank you and take care and stay safe and let Catherine and I know if you have any other questions. Thank you. And thank you so much for running. I know that it is a, um, you know, a huge uh, task to undertake. And there's a lot of vitriol out there that you expose yourself to. And we've seen that all over the course of the past year. Um, no one, no, everyone gets some in. We get enough hate mail just on our website. Uh, I hate to see what it would be like with the public email. Um, so thank you for, you know, dealing with that and, and putting so much positive energy out there. We're trying to put positive energy out there for you too. I really, I really appreciate that. And um, meetings like this really help <laughs> to balance <laughs> that out. So yes. uh, it's really, it's really great to see all of you. I appreciate your questions and all you're working on. And uh, thank you very much for your time. See you on the party. Of course. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Hope to see you at an upcoming meetup.